you know, in the context of green space and climate resilience, is there one thing that you, or a thing that you would ask them to do to be helpful to um, these efforts going forward? Chris? Yeah, I think um, uh, there's a lot of great planning work that's been done. I think now's the time to do some real demonstration projects to put something in the ground in a public environment so that people can uh, touch and feel and smell. We need to make sure that the demonstration exemplars that we hope to create are highly educated and openly uh, researched, openly visited, openly toured so that we can create a flywheel for uh, worldwide success because we will not be resilient uh, one and only. We will be resilient only all of us together. We don't have any time to simply be planning anymore. We need to start taking action. Uh, and even in the state, you know, we have blue Massachusetts and it's progressive Massachusetts. Um, we need more action. assemblage of experts um, who are going to take you through this topic and we're very excited about it. The Leventhal Math and Education Center is an independent nonprofit organization and it's part of our mission to inspire people's curiosity and learning through maps. A few words about Chris Cook who will introduce tonight's topic. Chris is our Chief of Environment, Energy and Open Space and the Commissioner of the Boston Parks Department. He's responsible for leading the mayor's cabinet in enhancing the quality of life in Boston by protecting air, water, climate, and land resources and preserving and improving the integrity of Boston's architectural and historic resources. Please help me welcome Chris Cook. Thank you so much, and thank you to the Leventhal uh, Map Center. And uh, I just have to also just a very brief shout out to the Boston Public Library. I spend uh, more Sundays than not starting my day at uh, St. John's in West Roxbury, and then I move to another house of worship right here at the Copley Branch of the Boston Public Library with my daughters, and we spend the better part of an afternoon. Uh, I research things so I can actually do my job, and they pick up books and have a good time. But I'm uh, very, very grateful to the library, very grateful to uh, the Leventhal Map Center for promulgating these ideas of our democracy and encouraging discussions like this. I will be brief because it's an excellent panel and it's far more interesting to hear from them, but I think some context on the city's commitment to these issues and also just speaking sort of of how we got here might be uh, germane to the conversation. 1634, America's first park, Boston Common, and since then, the park system has expanded, whether it was in the 1870s and 1880s through Olmsted and then Elliott's work with the MDC. You know, when we look through this map and we see that these are the systems of green, those were in response to opportunities and those were in response to the idea that people should have spaces to recreate and people should have places to have fun but they were also in response to a very clear need to deal with stormwater management. They were also in response to deal with the fact that our city was rapidly densifying and that we needed to offset some of those things that come with rapid density and ra rapid population growth. And so you see that from very early on in Boston Park's legacy, parks had to be something a little bit more here. You had to get a twofer or a threefer out of it. So maybe it had to deal with equity and the democratization of space that Olmsted so poorly believed in, but also maybe it had to deal with the stormwater management system. And so as we explore our opportunities moving into 2018, we have to look to the defining issue of our time, and that is the fact that climate change is real. I don't say that because I believe any of you don't think climate change is real, but I say that because there are people in our country that still believe that. It's real and we're dealing with it. In January and March, we saw how far the, the ocean can come and those were not major storms. And so we look at our coast and we think about how our coast can be resilient, not just to protect those who live upon it, but to protect the jobs of those who come to our city every single day and to also protect the transportation networks that connect into our city and into the neighborhoods that we cherish and we love and that define our city. Our parks have to do more now than the, they've been doing. 
and we've got great thinkers on this on these projects. These are not new thoughts. If you look at uh, old plans for the Boston Harbor and the South Bay Trails, people have been thinking along these lines for quite some time. The difference now is that we've lost the cushion to not take action. So we have to move beyond plans and we have to move to implementation. Over the next few weeks, you'll be hearing about the city's commitment to the implementation of some of these plans. But I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize the hard work of people in this room. First off, there's amazing park advocates who have been asking for this kind of investment for some time, and I'm very grateful for that. There's also been extraordinary leadership on, on this issue for some time in the city, and certainly my former boss, Brian Sweat, former chief of environment, was one of those people who's been leading this charge and now does so in the private sector. And also former parks employees and current parks employees, as well as Scott Dupuy and Michelle Foltz, who have really help me, uh, help educate me on the importance of these spaces and very grateful to their commitment. But now is the time that we're going beyond planning or moving to implementation. So when we look at projects and the opportunities like Martin's Park on Four Point Channel, we're gonna build an extraordinary playground. We're gonna build a playground there right next to the Children's Museum that's accessible to all so that everyone feels welcome there. It's gonna be beautiful, it's gonna be a playground in a setting as gorgeous as the public garden. But guess what, it's also gonna be resilient and we're gonna make sure that it helps the neighborhood and that that park will be there for years to come. When we look at opportunities like Mopley Park that you'll hear about later, you'll see that things can be places where we play baseball, but they can also protect Mary McCormick housing and old colony housing from flooding. These are important projects to us. So I just wanna let you know that the city is committed to these actions and we really need your support to help us advance those commitments. That being said, moving on to the panel, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you your moderator. Um, Dante Ramos is the editor of the Boston Globe Ideas section. He also writes a regular opinion column. He was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2014 for his editorials on how a button-down culture limits Boston's vitality. How about a round of applause for that? <laughs> He came to the Globe in 2006 from the Times Picayune in New Orleans, where he reported before, during, and after Hurricane Katrina. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a huge Boston Public Library welcome for Dante Ramos. Good evening. Uh, thanks to all of you for being there tonight. Thanks, uh, Chris, for that kind introduction. The uh, terrific map behind me um, shows Charles Eliot's vision for a park system that uh, is not just in the city of Boston, but stretches across the Boston region. If, if you haven't yet seen the exhibit upstairs in the Leventhal map room, you, you really should check it out either, either tonight or before it closes. Uh, Dory, the curator, gave me a tour the other night, and it really underscores how the system of parks had a purpose. Um, it was a health measure. So people wouldn't succumb to miasma. Um, today our air is pretty clean, and uh, density, which has, uh, which as mentioned, was a factor in this. We're we're sort of rethinking density and uh, and its role in the city. Um, the miasma theory of disease transmission has not held up, but the spaces that this vision left behind have become a cherished part of our landscape and serve multiple purposes. Um, uh, they, they, in addition to recreation, they also provide transportation. Um, as linear parks along the Charles River and the Esplanade become uh, superhighways for bicyclists and pedestrians, something that the city and I think a lot of people in this room are trying to encourage. Uh, in an era of rising sea levels, people are looking to parks for another purpose, to retain water during high tides and storm surges. The trustees of reservations, if you've been following the news, are uh, thinking about a Four Point Channel Park that would double as a bit of flood control infrastructure. There's talk of a sapphire necklace, a string of parks to promote climate resiliency all along our waterfront. Uh, you know, more broadly, there's a lot of thinking. You'll hear tonight the word resiliency thrown around. You'll hear words like water retention um, thrown around. And people are trying to get a grip on what that could mean and how parks could contribute to that. What we're trying to figure out tonight is, uh, what does a sapphire necklace, what would something that like, like that look like, who would organize it, who would pay for it, and what are the problems we need to solve? 
Um, we've got a great panel of experts tonight, and uh, we'll have a brief presentation first from two of them. Let me, let me first introduce uh, Chris Reed, who is a landscape architect and founding director of SOS Landscape Urbanism. He is recognized internationally as a leading voice in the transformation of landscapes and cities and works alternately as a researcher, strategist, teacher, designer, and advisor. Chris. place to be a little bit more southern where they actually talk back to you here. Um, Doing well, how are you? Very good, thank you. Uh, uh, a few slides, introductory slides, not my slides. This was uh, January 2018 and, and, and really brings to life uh, the issue that we're all uh, talking about and confronting here. Um, and Chris mentioned uh, Mobley Park that we're involved in. It's not just uh, the water coming in from the ocean. Uh, here, it's also water falling down onto the city and collecting in places. The frequency and intensity of storms these days um, is much higher uh, and is really putting a lot of pressure uh, on urban systems. And that's the full uh, Elliott map that Dante was just uh, describing, really capturing this notion of open space at, at a regional scale. For me, uh, I just want to echo some of the comments that both Chris and Dante uh, just made. Uh, climate change and sea level rise are not just challenges that we need to confront or defend against, but so many of us think about climate change uh, and sea level rise as opportunities, uh, opportunities for Boston in one particular way to recapture and renew its legacy of open space. Open space is form giver and image of the city. Open space is soul uh, of the city in many ways. This is Olmsted's uh, drawing of the Emerald Necklace from the Back Bay Fens and the Charles River all the way through uh, Franklin Park. Chris spoke about this well. This work was born of, of social reform movements. Um, it was meant to improve the health and quality of life uh, in the city, uh, particularly to residents who didn't have access to some of these uh, 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 similar kinds of resources uh, outside of the city. These parks were uh, for recreation, habitat. Um, they served to connect neighborhoods with, with transit ways and parkways, um, uh, and even integrated what we now know as the D-Line, uh, public transit line of the MBCA. They also served important roles in flood control. So the idea of parks as serving multiple functions really goes back to Olmsted uh, in Boston uh, in the late 19th century. This is contemporary Boston. And what we've done is, is highlighted some of the open spaces throughout the city. Uh, but you can also see the blue areas over some uh, developed areas of the city. Those are the projected flood maps. Uh, that really tell the tale of what will happen uh, when sea level rise and storm surge uh, start to be uh, increased and exacerbated over the coming uh, years and decades. That's Olmsted's necklace uh, throughout that. Uh, and again, this flood control map uh, has been giving us, um, uh, many of us, the opportunity to really think big. Uh, can we imagine a 21st century climate adapted version of this system, one that rings the entire harbor uh, with parks and open spaces and new recreational destinations and new kinds of habitat connected by a series of trails and bikeways um, and kayak paths and boating paths that really adds to the legacy of Boston uh, as a leader in both uh, open space design uh, and resiliency. What does that look like? Uh, we've had the opportunity to work with the city uh, and its partners and many other uh, public and private entities the last few years to begin to imagine what these places might look like. Uh, in East Boston along the waterfront, um, this is part of the proposal to really remake that waterfront into a, a connected series of open spaces that offer new recreational opportunities, new gathering spaces on the waterfront, new living shorelines and floating pathways that get people out into the water, that allow people to get down to the water 
uh, and really connect to it and to touch it. Um, these open spaces uh, are really designed to defend in many ways against the storm and against the surge and are built to sort of withstand the forces involved there. Uh, but in many ways are first and foremost a new set of open space resources for the folks who live in communities like East Boston that don't have access uh, to waterfront open spaces. But they also set the groundwork um, uh, for selected development sites to begin to uh, expand the opportunities for affordable housing and diverse housing types and to meet some of the other challenges uh, that Boston faces. This is what happens when you do it at the district scale, but individual property owners can do things uh, that are e as equally uh, compelling. Uh, some work we did with the New England Aquarium uh, and CBT on the Blue Way uh, downtown, creating a direct connection uh, from the Rose Kennedy Greenway past the aquarium site uh, to Boston Harbor. Uh, at the site scale, there are opportunities to integrate seaside gardens uh, and multi-level pathways that can be inundated and flood over time. Uh, even floating walkways um, uh, that float up and down with the tides and can adjust uh, to varying levels of, of sea level uh, over time. And in this case, actually giving a great opportunity for a living laboratory for an institution uh, like the aquarium uh, to give kids from the inner city an opportunity to learn uh, about climate change uh, in situ in a real living, uh, working uh, public space. And then there are also opportunities offshore uh, as well. We can begin to imagine uh, what would happen if we added to or extended some of the islands. Uh, I and a number of folks participated at a conference at, at Harvard's Graduate School of Design that was co-hosted uh, by the Stone Foundation and Boston Harbor Now. Uh, with a group of people really imagining what happens if you might extend the uh, Harbor Islands. The islands serve important uh, functions in terms of uh, attenuating or dampening the waves that are kicked up by ocean storms. And so here we began to imagine extensions to these islands that would serve as much uh, to create uh, uh, resilient barriers uh, to those waves as they would to create new opportunities for recreation, for beachfront, for kayak landings, uh, for, for uh, kelp gardens and shellfish gardens, uh, creating new kinds of destinations uh, throughout the harbor. And lastly, um, going back to one of the first points uh, that Commissioner Cook mentioned, uh, the idea of how resilience can be paired uh, with social equity uh, agendas. Um, Mobley Park in South Boston, 60 Acre Park, uh, is one of Boston's uh, largest waterfront parks. And it's 15 minutes from the widest variety of Boston na Boston's neighborhoods. It's not just uh, accessible to people in South Boston and Dorchester and Mary Ellen McCormick, uh, but it's really only a 15 minute ride to Dudley Square, uh, to inner city neighborhoods uh, in Roxbury and Dorchester uh, and beyond. And so there's a real opportunity to, to address some of the lingering inequities uh, from the 19th and 20th century to give kids in Dudley Square the idea that um, uh, with a very short uh, set of safe connections, they can get immediately to the waterfront uh, and really be part of that waterfront experience, living life as, as somebody from Boston uh, who understands that they're a city uh, on the harbor. So amazing opportunities here, uh, amazing groundwork. It's gonna take a lot of work and it's gonna take work um, in the private sector, in the public sector, uh, and in the nonprofit uh, and philanthropic sector to all come together uh, to begin to execute this. So I'll leave it there, thank you. Our next panelist is Ellen Watts. She is an architect and co-founder of Architera in Boston, one of the winners of the Boston Living with Water competition. Architera's portfolio of zero energy and energy positive buildings has garnered more than 30 design awards. Uh, Watts is a design leader, policy advocate, and ideas champion. Uh, welcome, Ellen.
operated under the mistaken but widely held belief that while weather is changeable, climate, which is the atmospheric behavior over a much longer term, is static, sort of like gravity. It's just there. Accordingly, as any architect like myself could tell you, we've used historical 100-year flood maps to site our buildings, 30-year trailing averages of temperatures to size our mechanical systems, and previously recorded hurricanes and blizzards to establish design criteria for the strength of our roofs, windows, and structural systems. It's only been about 20 years now since climate scientists informed us that in fact climate was not steady on average, as generally believed, but actually changing due to measurable and rapidly increasing greenhouse gases, principally due to the burning of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas, principally to heat and cool our buildings, provide transportation, and enable various industrial processes. Katrina and Sandy hit hard and focused our attention, as have Harvey, Maria, Irma, and Florence since. Less than a decade ago, there was another really big reveal. Using elaborate computer modeling, climate scientists forecast within a reasonable degree of certainty that sea level, which rose just some inches last century, is likely to rise several feet during this century. Additionally, they warned us of increasingly hot, wet, and stormy conditions, and for coastal cities, increasingly higher storm surges. So this evolving climate science coincides with a really important megatrend. Humans are increasingly migrating to cities. 68% of the world's population will live in cities by the year 2050, up from just 55% today. And the significance of this is that two-thirds of the world's major cities included, include low-lying areas close to sea level. So the question becomes then how we can not just survive, but thrive with some of the visions uh, that, uh, that lie before us. How can we achieve both carbon neutrality and climate adaptation while accommodating human densification? This is a moment not to retreat from cities, but to reinvent them. To imagine the possibilities, let's look at some rendering produced for the Boston Living with Water competition, reflecting an ambitious but very practical integrated vision for 100 acres. This happens to be along the Fort Flint Channel, but one of Boston's many sites built in the 19th century, originally underwater, part of the Dorchester Flats. The competition brief was very clear. Imagine it's the year 2100, Sea level has risen five feet, and now we're occasionally getting storm surges of five feet above that. You'll notice that there are floatable tidal basins tiered to match the grades of the surrounding elevated streets in this area, which were remnants of the 19th century railroad industry. The tiered steps accommodate tidal fluctuations as well as sea level rise and storm surge, and importantly, every day, all day, provide public waterfront access all kinds of recreation opportunities and supportive wildlife habitat. It is an example of one of the many, many green-gray solutions for addressing flooding hazards while enhancing the very positive qualities of water for beauty, for inspiration, for public benefit, for health and recreation. You'll also see zero energy buildings that sit rather than guggle energy from rooftop solar panels. Such buildings were, until very recently, thought to be impossible, but have now been proven to be completely viable by over a thousand examples in the U.S. alone across virtually every project type. They had continuous insulation, good control of the glass area, openings designed to resist high wind speeds and impact, and first floors constructed of materials impervious to water, with mechanical and electrical equipment installed well above the flood line. Resilient cities of the future will evolve to be less dominated by cars. On-demand autonomous vehicles will provide economical ride-sharing with minimum wait times, relieving the demand for parking, which now dominates our cities. Areas previously allocated for parking spaces will be reappropriated for beautiful landscapes, bikeways, drainage infrastructure, creating what are called smart streets, as illustrated on the left. 
flood resilient public transportation, all electric and above ground to be resilient to flooding, will be served by covered raised platforms that allow fast loading at the speed of all the great transit systems of the world. Resilient retrofit solutions for existing buildings will be necessary too, and there are many, many strategies. One shown on the right, bulkheads a cluster of existing 19th century buildings, creating a, a lower level courtyard. Um, there are many other solutions depending on buildings' age, construction types, vulnerabilities, and uh, perspective damage. Buildings can be not only energy collectors, but rainwater collectors as well. Blue and green roofs provide temporary detention in the case of heavy downpours, which are predicted, and help augment drainage structures while reducing uh, heat island effect for cities. Buildings can also be thermal storage facilities. For example, contemplate instead of parking garages, you have insulated thermal storage tanks that feed resilient district energy solutions. If one city plant went down, there would be dozens of others to serve as a backup. And this vision, as shown on the right, proposes no less built density than any previous master plan in 20 years. That's very important to say. It's six million square feet of mixed <coughs> use development plus 50% more open space. And this is very important because development produces private investment, uh, supports jobs, housing, and tax revenues. Well, the greater amount of green space afforded by slightly higher buildings uh, between seven and 17 stories uh, supports more public recreation, rainwater infiltration, cooling, and carbon absorption. So finally, we can't know the shape that the future will take. It's always a little bit of a leap of imagination as these floating thermal jellyfish on the upper left, designed for seawater energy transfer and totally hypothetical illustrate. Encouragingly, it's important to say that the business case for renewable technologies is fast improving. Solar panels today are 50% more efficient at half the cost than they were just five years ago. And wind technology is promising to generate uh, electricity at half the cost of fossil fuel generated power. Battery storage top, uh, technology is also rapidly advancing and LED technology for lighting has revolutionized that industry. Cities all over the world are uniting to prioritize climate action. And in this context, nothing is more important than leading by example. Urgently needed are solutions like some of these illustrated examples to integrate landscapes, buildings, transportation systems, energy infrastructure, and community engagement. The fastest way to deploy these promising solutions is to pilot them, ideally on a district scale, as might be funded by a collaborative public-private philanthropic partnership. Let's ignore the headlines that say we're losing the climate wars and Press on with action powered by innovation, technology, and design. In that way, I believe we can transform our cities to ever more livable, equitable, and truly beautiful spaces. So when I saw the floating thermal jellyfish, I thought, you know, we've actually got our answer. We could end the panel right here. Um, just get some floating thermal jellyfish. But if that is not the answer, uh, in the rare possibility that's not, uh, we have uh, three more panelists who uh, can come and discuss some other things that we might do. Um, I would like to, um, I guess the first question, given that we have some representatives of philanthropy here, um, we've seen some great stuff up on the screen. Uh, also some things that are very complicated to bring into life. And I'm curious, Kalila, what role you think philanthropy might play in all of this? Uh, I note that the Barr Foundation just signed on with a number of other funders to a major climate resilience initiative. I, I hope your answer is that, well, we'll just write a check for everything, but I suspect it's not. Uh, yes, that is not my answer. Um, <laughs> First, uh, you know, I want to say thanks for the opportunity to be here um, and be a part of this important conversation. And um, it's great to be here at the library, so I was able to clear out my library account so I can take out books again, so that was a super for the evening. 
Um, and what I like about the conversation that we're having tonight is because it is focused on climate uh, and parks and open space. So uh, a means to have a conversation that is recognizable to average everyday people and really meaningful. So unfortunately, one of the reasons, you know, why Bar can't just write a big check is that these are uh, billion dollar solutions and our endowment is in fact just not that large. Um, but I think part of um, the conversation as well is that this is, um, this is a challenge to our democracy, it's a challenge to our system of governance, and it requires uh, a number of different actors to be at the table, philanthropy just being one of them. Just to say a couple of things, BAR has been in the environmental funding space since it began. And about 10 years ago, uh, we took the opportunity to shift to having our environmental funding focus on climate change. So we're looking at resiliency, mobility, and also clean energy. And so for us, we think about our role in this space as being a connector, um, as uh, being able to bring a public conversation uh, to talk about the issues of the day in a way that's accessible to people, to fund strategies and research ideas that help to get at some of the, the hard intersections that we're talking about. Just in the back room, we were talking about some of the legal challenges to doing some of this work. Uh, and so we really see our role as helping to put uh, the right folks in the room to have the conversation, uh, and then also to take, keep an eye out for who is not traditionally at the table, who often gets left out when conversations about resiliency, and how do we really bring those voices forward? There was a lot of mention in the, um, in the prior uh, presentations about equity, and those are important questions. And we really have to figure out how do we put equity at the center of these conversations and not just retrofit it in at the end after we have beautiful designs. What does it actually mean to engage community, to listen to them, to take leadership from them? Great, thank you. Um, uh, Brian, uh, also with a uh, long history in philanthropy, but also across cities. Maybe you can start by telling us, um, you know, based upon your experience, how, how are we situated here in Boston? Are our, um, you know, are our challenges unique? Are they similar to every coastal city in the country? What, how, do you, how do you think we compare to other places? Boston feels terrible, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, you know, being uh, no longer with philanthropy, now I can talk about philanthropy. Um, and I, I just want to, I'll follow up on your question, but I just want to uh, make a point about um, philanthropy's role in, in all of this work. I do think um, that there are enough dollars around, and whether you're looking at philanthropy or the public sector, I used to be with HUD, um, if, if, if the view to a lot of this work is just the money will solve the challenges that we have, uh, we are going to continue to be at a loss. Um, some of the things that we are most confronted with, as everyone in this room knows, is the political rancor of all of this. That's not a financial equation. Um, that is a very um, a partisan, cultural, fractured, fractured beliefs that aren't just existing in this country right now. Um, I see this when I go into Australia. I see this when I visit parts of Africa. I see this uh, heavily in parts of Latin America. Um, and so the source, I think, of resilience is the starting place of resilience is people. Um, and coming together and really trying to understand the different points of view on land, resources, and how people see those things um, very differently. Um, a really great example of this, and I'll, I'll, I'll state something that I think a lot of people are familiar with is Medellin, Colombia, um, right? And the conflict, the war uh, and drug conflict that existed in that place for a long, long time. Um, and the source of that is the rural-urban divide. Um, people were coming uh, and trying to access economic opportunity. Um, uh, agriculture was sort of changing, and the forces were pushing people in the cities out of the drug conflict. Um, and 
you know, as we talk today about Medellin and, and resilience and try to consult them to think about the sustainability of the land, the flooding of the uh, hillsides in the area, the conversation has to start with whose land is it, what purposes are, um, what housing and availability of housing is like. So um, one of the things that, that we learned uh, at the Rockefeller Foundation in trying to do climate resilience work uh, in parts of Asia uh, that were prone to high levels of sea rise, uh, Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, India, um, was that we could not parse out climate change from these really core, deep-seated views and values about how to use the land, um, what authority there was around the land, um, access, privilege, and, and equity. So that's a global issue, and I just, I think it's really important to state from the beginning that uh, I see resilience as a, a real human condition um, about those kinds of values, and once you can begin to surface that, uh, you can find agreement about design solutions later. Getting back to Boston, um, I, I'm, I was really proud when we chose Boston. Um, some folks in the room, like Chris might know, Boston had applied two other times actually before 100 Resilient Cities actually selected them. Um, and it was because Boston's earlier applications were entirely focused on climate and they didn't have a point of view of some really other significant resilience issues that the city faced, um, equity being one of them. So uh, when Mayor Walsh kind of came into office with an equity point of view and wanted to connect that with uh, what were some of the other forces that were going to change and some of the other threats that Boston faced in the 21st century, um, climate being one of them, access to affordable housing being another large one, uh, transportation being another, and a commitment to look at those things as integrated issues and not just parsed out issues is a really big premise about how we think about resilience and how we would, we how the Rockefeller Foundation and 100 Resilient Cities would look at the answer to that question, how is Boston doing? Great, thank you. Um, Ryan, I think one of the premises of these types of conversations is that, you know, we all sit here on these stages and talk about things and ultimately we kind of want the public sector to do something. You know, the, the person in the room representing the public sector is ultimately the person where like, okay, what are you gonna do about it? Uh, you're a veteran of the private sector, you're also a veteran of the public sector. How does this, as, as someone who has worked for the city and has been responsible for dealing with, you know, people's problems in a day-to-day -day basis, how do these, you know, how do you look at these sort of conversations, uh, you know, how, what's, when these requests come uh, to like, let's turn the conversation towards resiliency, how does that look on a day-to-day -day basis in City Hall? How do you translate that into your work? So it's just a question. Uh, so it's nice to be back to a lot of friendly folks in the audience. Um, and Chris, excellent job teeing this off and, uh, and carrying the mantle. Um, I think in the public sector, it's important to start the conversation from where people are at. And what are the current stresses and shocks? And you know, Eric, we've had the privilege of working with 100 RC since the get-go and designing the uh, city resilience framework, which really lays out all of the different types of stresses and shocks that impact people's lives on a daily basis. And for this issue, in terms of you know climate change and land base, it's not oftentimes where you start, but you do wind up making direct connections fairly quickly to a lot of the issues that are impacting people's lives um, on an immediate basis. And I think one of the changing, you know, one of the changing discourse of this conversation, I think there are two that I have. Like one is, uh, this is no longer looking out to another generation. Uh, and so I remember a phenomenal ad that uh, the Environmental Defense Fund did in the early 2000s with uh, somebody standing in front of the train on the tracks saying, I don't really care about climate change, it's not gonna impact me. You know, you know I'll be long gone by the time the issue uh, comes to fruition, <coughs> excuse me, and then steps aside and there's a small child who you think is the person's kid, you know, on those tracks. Within 10 years, we're beyond that. The current generation of folks you know, with us now uh, is feeling the impacts of climate change in a detrimental way around the world and will continue to do so in a worsening fashion, but for action we take now. And when we talk about targets to measure sort of where we're going to, and we do 2040 planning or 2050 planning, 2050 is 32 years away. 
How many folks in the room know somebody who's 32 years or younger? Right? It's like that's not a long time. And so, you know, that, that paradigm changes where it's no longer an issue that, you know, will face my kids, my grandkids, it's facing most of us in the audience today will be living with the impacts of whether or not we hit goals to avoid cataclysmic um, climate change or whether or not you know, we can actually manage this uh, or it's a runaway freight train. And so I think part of it is connecting the solutions, and I love that the perspective of this conference is about, or of this panel is about sort of solutions, because the solutions happen to be better for public health, for economic well-being, for uh, ec uh, social equity, uh, and environmental justice, and we need to lead with the solutions while maintaining the sense of urgency to drive them. Because my switch to the private sector recently it allows me to have even more faith and confidence that we don't have technical challenges in delivering this. We have some economic challenges, and not because of the value, but because our system doesn't recognize the value. It's not a pure cost issue, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of sort of who pays and benefits. And we have a political challenge, and a governance challenge related to politics. And so I think you know, we need to get out of the, you know, and it's, and in my mind, I, I just had the privilege of coming from the um, Global Climate Action Summit last week uh, that Governor Brown hosted in San Francisco. When the issue is framed as the public health crisis that it is, and it's climate change impact on a global public health crisis, it is a much stronger selling point for a much broader swath of the population than talking about the climate. Because the reality is uh, the Earth, in its holistic standpoint, and the planet will be fine. We're the ones who are in trouble. Uh, and it's impacting us in a myriad of ways that we need to address directly uh, and in a way that checks all of the boxes that both Brina and, and Khalil were mentioning, because that's the way you get folks engaged is when they see relevance to the actions to their day-to-day -day stresses and shocks. Great, thank you. Um, one of the things that um, strikes me um, in hearing all of your comments is that um, there's an emphasis on collective effort, on uh, the public sector and philanthropy and the private sector coming together. I I'm struck in thinking back to the Elliott map um, that you can see upstairs that um, there were structures in those days. There was a metropolitan or regional parks commission that um, you know, basically used a lot of muscle to make a lot of things happen. Um, a lot of things happen beyond, ci beyond city lines. But those are things that are now part of the uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation. But that's, been, you know, that's part of the state agency and they have things in Holyoke that they need to deal with. They have things in Springfield that they need to deal with. So they, can, they, they essentially can't spend all of their time thinking about things in the Boston region. The next smallest unit is the city of Boston, which uh, whose boundaries are actually quite small. What, what is missing on a regional level um, in order to, for all of the things that we're talking about, uh, to galvanize philanthropy, to draw things on a map and make it happen, what are we missing on a regional level that could actually make stuff happen? Uh, Brian, I see you nodding. I'm nodding a lot because I, I love this question, and it's not just for Boston. This is a, this is a how do jurisdictions work together globally is just a sort of mashup of problems. Um, and so when you, you, know, you think about the physical boundaries of place and different cities actually working together, or different regions working together, um, there's so many different um, structures and authorities that have to connect to actually get this kind of work done. One of, one of the favorite examples that I often cite with this is in the US, um, at least half of our cities that have already released strategies are very interested in doing district energy work. Um, district energy is when energy is distributed from um, a, a very highly localized place. So you would think you would have that authority to work at a hyper-local level um, for the production of energy, and that is just not so. Um, energy is regulated by uh, the states, oftentimes by um, uh, state public-private enterprises, the incentives come from national governments, trying to think about how low income, those hyper-local energy spots um, connect uh, within the you know, city existing structures. Um, there's so much complexity in doing what you might want to do at a hyper-local scale and think that you have the flexibility and freedom to do. And then there's this sequencing thing that happens of what do you do first? Do you try to find the financing first and work with the philanthropy to think about you know, localized energy and low-income communities? Um, or do you actually start working with the state authority first and piss the locals off? 
So there's just so much complexity, complexity in, um, in implementation. And you need people who are really good at coordinating across those levels. Yeah, I was going to add to that. Um, one of the other interesting aspects of the uh, commission plan um, was the work that Charles Elliott did to help set up the trustees of reservations. I think I think the um, founding of that organization was coincident with, with the plan. So in addition to the metropolitan um, uh, government that was uh, looking over this, the trustees were set up uh, modeled really after the trustees of an arts institution uh, where folks could uh, donate to that and, and then the trustees would help oversee some of those <coughs> open space resources. So this was the private sector through a nonprofit, through philanthropy, actually helping to, to, to bridge some of those gaps uh, between um, things that were happening locally and things that were happening uh, regionally. And that's another aspect to this is, is how can those have been doing work, Boston Harbor now has been doing incredible work uh, along the waterfront for years with the Harbor Walk. Uh, the roles of these kinds of organizations in bridging those gaps is essential. I was just going to I think underlying your question is whether or not we have the right governance structures to deliver on this, right? And to be able to you know, move fast enough to deliver some of the infrastructure uh, that was presented. And I think that's exactly the appropriate question to be asking. Uh, because as governance and politics is part of that challenge, you know, we have had interesting collaborations around this. The city of Boston helped lead, led the creation of the Metro Mayor's Coalition uh, to address climate change, recognizing that the bizarre boundaries that Boston has is not you know, based on nature ecosystems or natural lines, it's based on politics from hundreds of years. Uh, and does that service us from a governance perspective to be able to deliver uh, on the climate resilience we need? You know, I, I look back and think about the MWA summary, right? We decided that we didn't have the regional wholesale water infrastructure available, uh, also water infrastructure organization to deliver a clean Boston Harbor. It was created and actually wound up being one of the phenomenal success stories that you know, folks in the room remember that there were a lot of naysayers saying Boston Harbor can never be clean. And a different government structure was set up to deliver that massive infrastructure project. And so I think it's the right question now to ask, can we deliver uh, on you know, this vision of regional solutions to climate change that are open space and land based given our current structures? And if we can't, I would start moving in that direction and having that conversation in a very real way soon. Um, I'm also curious um, about the role that the development community should be playing in this. Um, Ellen, you, uh, you, know, you showed some great images of mixed use development and um, you know, there's a funny little dance that happens in, in Boston between developers and um, the city makes certain requests and, you know, there's a negotiation that happens and, um, and you know, people are not always satisfied with what, what comes out. I would say probably more often than not, there's, there's a lot of people who end up leaving unsatisfied. And, um, you know, what we don't often end up with are very big things. The things that you showed us on screen were very uh, major, uh, major types of infrastructure plans. And, um, you know, how do you, how do you, between now and the, uh, was it 2100? Between now and then, how do you see that act, those things coming about? I just want to make sure this is on. Uh, first off, while the integrated design solutions are one level of complexity, what I didn't mention about any of these renderings I showed you was another thing that astonished us as we worked on these challenges, which is that none of what we showed, absolutely none, is possible under current city, state, and federal regulations. If you, we didn't do a, a major paper on it, but we could. That, that seems like not a minor issue. It's not a minor issue. And <laughs> when you talk about the, the role of the development community has always been to negotiate entitlements to proceed with projects. So they have a certain forte in that, which we should encourage, because there's going to be a lot of negotiation to collaboratively overhaul regulations that are intended to protect the public health and safety, but are no longer precautionary nearly enough. 
And the reason I feel so strongly it's going to have to be a negotiation and can actually harness the strength of the development community is I think a lot of bright lawyers have thought uh, hard about how they could possibly tra uh, transform the regulatory framework for the built environment and, and almost said, if so, Byzantine, it's hopeless. We'll need to negotiate our way through it sooner than we can change all the regulations. So I'm talking everything from building codes to zoning codes to Chapter 91 regulations to Army Corps uh, you know, uh, navigation regulations. So I think the development um, community has one more major role to play, which is to plow private investment big time into the most uh, promising resilient solutions that again uh, are not just buildings, not just landscape, but also grab a piece of what the public um, realm has uh, long provided, which is open space and infrastructure as well. I believe they can do that. It's interesting, right now, private developers are doing work uh, that, does in, that does integrate some of these uh, techniques um, in, into their own uh, parcels. The challenge, though, is that water and flood extends beyond property boundaries. And so um, even a parcel by parcel strategy is still gonna let water through the gaps between uh, those parcels, and it may actually exacerbate the effects of that flooding. And so that's where integrated policy changes and the work that the city's doing, and the city is working right now, uh, particularly in East Boston, to build on the initial uh, planning work that was done to look at what are those specific policy and, and regulatory changes that would allow for um, these kinds of projects and these kinds of district-scale parks um, to move forward. Policy is one piece um, um, uh, in terms of how do you build it and permit it. Governance is the other. Um, it's, it's what we were showing is really a collection of publicly accessible open spaces built on a collection of public and private lands. And so the question is, who's responsible for uh, overseeing that? So there are a huge other set of challenges about what comes after uh, the, uh, construction and implementation. Uh, Kalila, in your opening remarks, you mentioned uh, there being legal challenges to achieving some of uh, some of what we're hoping to achieve here. Uh, other than all of our laws being completely inappropriate to the task, were there other legal challenges you had in mind? Also thinking about just some of the negotiations that need to happen in terms of you know, using private property in act the actual implementation, the construction of these of these areas. I think you know this is a moment where we need to act. each of our sectors, the public sector, the private sector, philanthropy, where we have to ask more of ourselves um, to really make this contribution. And so, you know, I know that. Uh, in these conversations, developers feel like they're being pushed to do more on affordable housing, more on this and more on that, and yeah, I mean, we all we all have to really, uh, you know, up the ante on what our contributions are. And I think, you know, the other piece, you know, as we talk about these resiliency around the parks and the open space too, is these are beautiful new buildings, new designs, but we also have you know, a housing stock in the city that is not prepared with, um, you know, this retrofitting work that needs to get done. And so how do we also think about that as another level of resiliency that will need to happen in addition to this? Um, can I add a couple? Yeah, please. So, so, so one to your specific question is, uh, is how slow, and you mentioned this as well, how slow our code is updated. And our frame of reference is inherently backwards looking. Uh, and that has to change because now our science of the conditions of what we know buildings need to withstand is far more sophisticated. So you know, building codes around the country, including in Boston, still take what was the worst previous storm, which until recently was the you know, um, 78 uh, in, in Boston Harbor, and plan to that, and that becomes your flood standards. We still have not updated the building code. We had some room for barrier, but we haven't updated the building code to think of it as forward looking. Even though there are plenty of tools out there to model changes in precip, changes in heat, extreme heat and extreme cold, uh, changes in uh, storm conditions and, and um, storm surge. And so I think you know part of it is changing our profession for what is expected of the useful life of infrastructure and buildings we're building today. And, and if, it's a, if it's a building or an asset that we expect to be in existence in 
like I said, and then we need to make sure that it is designed to use reasonable standards of precautionary principle for that climate in 2070 and codify that. It's not enough anymore to incentivize it. It can't be just the leaders who are preparing their buildings for that. It has to be the expectation for waterfront development. That, frankly, is the easy part. The harder part is the existing assets that we have at risk today. And, you know, Boston is the fourth most at risk city in the country uh, from a real estate value at risk for sea level rise and storm surge after New York, Miami, and New Orleans. And that's not one of those top five you want to be on. And so, the, to your question, the developer's role all of that real estate risk is borne by folks who own investments in that real estate today. And a lot of our high value real estate is along the waterfront. So the opportunity cost of doing nothing is what has to be compared against the first cost of taking action. Not zero, it's the opportunity cost, which is the expected loss going forward. Developers begin to realize that and owners begin to realize that when their insurance companies and their investors start to ask questions about the risk in their portfolios. And I can tell you from the private sector side, that is beginning to happen now. We work with a lot of private sector institutional owners, with pension funds, with insurance companies and investors who are getting very sophisticated about looking at real estate markets across the country and across the world, saying, well, how resilient is this city? I'm not only concerned about you know, the rent roll at this particular asset, but how resilient is that location? How prepared is that city to respond to climactic events? And if there's risk there, that gets priced into you know, how they value assets. So the financial implications are coming at us today. Uh, I want to get back to the previous question and, and give Brian a chance to uh, respond, but, but I am curious, this, um, this dynamic where people are having these conversations with their insurers, uh, I think a lot of people who are active on climate issues hope that insurance companies end up being the ones who lower the hammer on uh, some practices that perhaps need to change. How, to, to your knowledge, how, how serious about it are they? You know, is it one of those things that, that they say, Oh yeah, you probably should think about you know putting your uh, putting your mechanicals on the roof, or or is it really a serious part of the financial equation of whether something gets built to begin with? I could offer a little perspective on that. I see a real sleigh in the insurance industry. I see people like FM Global, who've always been extremely engineering based in their practice of insuring uh, property. Um, taking a hard line and saying we will not insure any building any longer within a 2% or 500 year flood line. Furthermore, if you build something that we're going to insure or own something that we're going to insure, we're going to ask you to provide certain resiliency uh, solutions, including the location of mechanical electric equipment and the design of the uh, building envelope. Um, Contrasting with that, I see other insurers who are espousing um, the continuance of the business solution to climate change, is how they phrase it. And they will simply price you any policy and insure any risk, no matter where your building is, even in standing water, uh, regularly, uh, at some cost. And that's their business strategy. And so I think that still leaves us with the very practical and somewhat moral dilemma about what to do Insurance is but one piece of um, bridging the gap before we have better solutions. So I don't want to speak ill of it. We all need it. But on the other hand, that's not the final solution either. And I, I, I'd offer something uh, in, in addition to that about insurance. Um, you're all premium holders here. You pay for a fee. And so the largest insurance carrier in the nation is FEMA. When there is a disaster, all those taxable dollars go to uh, billions to Sandy or whatever is going to come. And so one of the ways that we actually, well, two things. So one of the things that I was incredibly surprised about um, is cities, as an entity, as a municipal entity, very rarely carry uh, uh, large insurance premiums, reinsurance for the city. Um, the city of San Francisco, for its earthquake insurance, carries a less than $10 million premium. This is because everyone expects FEMA to come in and fix it. So uh, I think a really important part of fixing 
the public asset of insurance is starting to get cities to recognize their role and their responsibility uh, in the city writ large as an asset and renegotiating our relationship with FEMA. We can no longer operate this way. Um, so, so that's just one thing to consider. Um, and then I think the other side of FEMA and all of you being insurance carriers for this, the nation's cities uh, post-disaster is um, FEMA's dirty little secret, which we tried to fix with um, uh, Rebuild by Design after Sandy and uh, some of the work that we did at HUD is um, their rules are to rebuild back the asset in exactly the way that it was. Many of you probably know this here. So um, if something is broken, uh, FEMA comes in and writes you a check to build, build that back in exactly the same way. So we're all talking about adaptation and the fact that these assets are not working the way we need them to be in the future, nor are they projected to last through that future. Now our US government is saying, forget about that, just rebuild it back exactly as it was, uh, which is pretty much the definition of insanity. So um, there's been a significant amount of you know lobbying to change that. Sean Donovan, the former uh, head of HUD, worked really hard uh, with the uh, Rebuild by Design and the National Disaster Competition, but I think that there's a long way to go there, and I think cities need to change their actual risk with insurance and start taking up greater responsibility and not, and not having that expectation fall from the federal government. Yeah, and I'd say uh, I'm, I'm equally not a fan of insurance being the right driver of this uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, at the end of the day, insurance is still a business outside of FEMA and FIRM, which if it was a business, would have been bankrupt because it's been operating at a loss every year since Katrina. Um, but most of these insurance companies are a business and they sell year over year policies. They are not long term invested in structure. They're invested in their self-preservation as a business. So where I go for the drivers that are gonna you know, find the value in the investments necessary to deliver this is the folks who are long-term owners. Uh, so cities first and foremost are, and you also can't insure against uh, you know, the economic losses of these storms. When people talk about insurance, it's usually rebuilding insurance. It's not, the city was flooded for a week, my business was closed. We there there are some reinsurance companies who are working very hard on that. Yes, I've yet to see a policy that comes anywhere close to covering, that is affordable to folks, to cover you know, economic losses of storms from a working perspective. And we went through that, frankly, with um, when the power went out, uh, when the Scotia Street Station went out and Back Bay was you know, closed for three and a half days. Most of those restaurants, most of those high-end offices had no um, business funding insurance. So there's that aspect. Then there's the aspect of where do you go if, that's, if, the, if the financial alignment isn't there, you can go to the long-term owners. So cities, Meds and Eds in Boston have been great. Our universities aren't moving. Our medical institutions aren't moving. There are long-term owners who when they're building a building you know, close to the waterfront or in different places or buying buildings have long-term holds. Those are folks who are saying, well, my risk profile is different if I intend on owning this asset for 15, 20 years. Or in the case of you know, MIT or Harvard or you know, Children's Hospital, they say, well, we're never selling this asset. And so those are the folks that have to provide the leadership from an investment perspective and then raise the bar for everybody else so we can get their regulatory work. But I, I'm convinced if we're waiting for insurance to be the driver, we're gonna be in far too much trouble by the time we get there, by the time that indicator is real. Uh, I have to confess, when we started this conversation, I thought it would turn more on parks than reinsurance, but um, I think it speaks to the complexity of, of the issues involved. Um, Kalila, I want to, uh, we'll, we'll go to the audience for questions in a, in a few minutes, but I, I wanted to go back to one uh, other important issue that you raised in your introductory remarks, which are, or which was, um, you know, the idea of equity in dealing with this. Um, the, some of the slides that we saw focused on, uh, you know, advanced development projects on the waterfront, which is always some of the priciest real estate in the city. But uh, as it was said, there, there, was an issue, there, there was an issue with existing housing stock. Uh, there's an issue of, um, you know, how to broaden the discussion beyond the, the developers you know, building up in the areas of the land with the most expensive square footage. Um, I, you know, what is what are we missing in this conversation about parks, about uh, equity, about reinsurance that um, might, you know, might inform a more equitable conversation about resilience in Boston? Um, I think part of it points to this 
something that we've talked to, touched on a little bit earlier, was, which is the issue of governance. And so, you know, I was um, today talking with folks at uh, the Boston Public Health Commission, emergency preparedness, and you know, we got into a conversation around resilience planning. And uh, one of the things that we came away from the conversation with was an understanding that people need to be a part of the resilience planning and people are the resilience plan. So uh, folks in this room, folks are, 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 we are gonna be the caretakers of these assets, looking out for them. And so we need to figure out what are the real on the ground structures to actually build, um, build a resiliency plan. So, um, you know, setting up uh, uh, as a part of you know grassroots organizations, committees, steering committees, where people have the opportunity to participate in you know how can we democratically plan for what these spaces are going to look like. You know, I think the city is taking some great steps forward in how they're building a conversation around locally, right? And so engaging people that are using the park for athletic purposes, but also you know the surrounding community and and shifting the frame of how we talk about development to just not just be about sort of who are the abutters that are right here, but really understanding these issues um, from a citywide perspective. I think the other thing that we have to think about in advance is how are we programming these new public spaces so that they're accessible to everyone, right? I mean, part of what's great about having this conversation in the library is that anybody can come in and participate. And so our parks should operate in very much the same way. And so then we need to think about programming. We need to think about how, um, about public safety in these parks. You know, who, um, who is going to be allowed to come to the parks and not be seen as a threat? Uh, and those are the kinds of dialogues that can happen through a really robust public engagement process where you're talking directly to community members. And, and it is, um, I think in some ways, not as hard as we, we you know, chalk it up to be. Um, it really is about relationship building because um, you know, when an event happens, people's neighbors are also first responders. And those are the folks that are gonna, have to, gonna be a part of the recovery process in the long term. So we need to get them bought in from the very beginning. Great, well, uh, why don't we see if there's any questions from the audience. I, I, I've got plenty of other questions and I bet you all do too, but is there, uh, first of all, is there a microphone that goes around? Oh, right there. Uh, if there's anyone who has a question, please feel free to come and ask it. Or don't all speak at once. <laughs> Um, Chris, I would put, to put the same question to you. I mean, we're, we've, we're, we were looking at Mowgli Park, and you were emphasizing how um, you know the park is open to people from um, you know from all around the city. At the same time, it's a park right down the water, and um, you know, are we talking primarily about these adaptations? Are we talking primarily about things that are? Um, happening right by the water, or you know, is this conversation about parks in particular, resilience more generally, is this something that needs to project deeper into the heart of the city and involving neighborhoods that aren't immediately on the water? Yeah, in, in a lot of ways we're using the <coughs> threat of sea level rise uh, as a catalyst to leverage other conversations uh, and, to gain, and to engage other communities. Um, Mobley Park is predominantly sports fields and you know, there's a lot of demand for sports fields uh, in the city. Um, uh, they're pretty well used. Um, but the conversations that we're having with various members of the community are, are op more open-ended questions about what else could be in the park that would allow you, that would first attract you, uh, that would get you there, and, and that frankly would allow you to spend a lot more time um, over the course of the day or a weekend um, enjoying different aspects of what it means to be in a park. So leveraging a waterfront connection from in, in most of the park, you can't actually see the water because it's, it's set so low um, and it's incredibly flat. Um, in other cases, it's, it's what are the other kinds of activities? And that's an open-ended question that we ask in a lot of cities. What is it, what kinds of programs would allow for new audiences to come to these places? And we specifically go into communities that aren't being asked those questions. 
so whether it's it's trying to find ways to interact with the kids in, in Dorchester and Roxbury, for instance, and give them an opportunity to have a voice. Um, one of the ways we do that um, is through uh, repeated engagement. So it's not a one-off. You don't just ask a question, have a meeting, and call it a day. It's about it's about developing relationships longer term uh, with people and connecting to the leaders and organizations in those communities um, so that they can uh, help propel that forward. But it's also about engaging activities like the one I'll put a plug in for Discover Mokley event on Saturday the 29th uh, coming up when Mokley is going to be turned into a, a festival park um, with a whole sort of range of different kinds of activities that aren't normally held in the park. So movies and food trucks and games and activities for kids um, uh, and, and these little igloo structures that my staff is building out of uh, floating tubes that you would normally sit, sit in the water in. The whole idea is to get people there that aren't normally using the park and show them the opportunity of what this uh, can be. Great. Um, question? Um, I'm Sarah Freeman, JP. Um, I have a question and a comment if there's time. The question is, um, on the second presentation, there were wonderful photos of a less car dependent future. And I guess um, I can fold both into one. Two elements I can picture to that. One depends, one would be to complete the gaps in the bike network that are deterrents to anyone but the most traffic tolerant cyclists. The bigger question though is there's a history of the public doesn't want increased T fares, they don't want increased taxes. How are we gonna improve public transit if we don't do one of those? Uh, so uh, I guess Ellen let you uh, take that first part. I think you have a wonderful observation and uh, come to understand it better uh, as I have only recently. Uh, the city of Boston, through its planning effort, Go Boston, has had a fabulous bike network plan for a very long time. But there are enormous gaps and big perils to uh, biking around the city today. Um, I have had my eyes open about what it can mean for a city to have a fabulous bike, bike network, not just connected, but really well planned with its own signals, its own curbing, its extra dimension uh, by recent uh, study abroad programs professionally uh, to Copenhagen. And I think there's even more we can do to enhance the bike plan uh, and fortify that, that infrastructure. I wouldn't neglect uh, pedestrian networks either. Uh, where I work in the Seaport District, there are still sidewalks, um, sometimes uh, narrowing and dead ending and uh, seemingly going to nowhere as well. And I'm sure that in future decades that will resolve itself, but more emphasis on that could take uh, the heat away from vehicles that are still, uh, all too often, still burning fossil fuels. Changes are coming fast though. I think the electric vehicles, uh, which have shown to be commercially viable, will catch on just to pick up the second part of the question, um, it was a question about taxes and 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 revenue essentially. And uh, you know, in my experience, the people who tend to participate in conversations like these about issues like climate resiliency are uh, somewhat more willing than the average person, and somewhat more willing than the average elected official to have a conversation about revenue. Um, you know, looking over at Rhina and wondering if there are cities that have been, um, you know, successful in some way, perhaps more successful than Boston, in persuading the public and persuading public officials that there is a revenue issue, the kind of revenue issue that the question was asking about, that needs to be solved. The Northern Europeans. I, I, generally, um, I, I think that there is, um, we talked about this a lot, you know, Americans have a unusual relationship between their independence and taxes and how they feel about that and the public officials who determine how those are consumed. Um, and it just different countries, different places have different relationships with um, taxes. That is very, very cultural. Um, 
I long fantasized about, you know, campaigns that could um, help people feel like they're more closely connected as a financier of their cities. Like, how could we change the dynamic that um, where people feel really good about what they're paying for and what they're getting in return in this in this country uh, at local, local, and all the way to the national level? One of the things that maybe some of you have heard about is participatory planning and participatory budgeting. Um, the innovator of that recently, he was our chief resilience officer in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Um, he passed away last month, but um, sort of exported this idea to the rest of the world, which was um, Porto Alegre would set aside a percentage of its, of its budget, its overall budget, and then within districts in, in the city, they would determine how those allocations were, were, were used. So people were uh, sort of directly come and vote with your feet um, with how those resources were going to be used. Um, it worked really, really well for a long time, but then, then you just got um, microcosms of political factions uh, sort of reincarnating themselves. So I don't have great answers other than um, I think people need a closer affiliation with how those resources are, are, are used and um, to take greater pride in, you know, your part of the community, your tax dollars actually are being used to build this common place. If I can jump off that theme specifically. Um, so as challenging as the 2016 election was for probably a lot of folks in the room, uh, one of the bright spots uh, was the vast majority, 80% of the transportation related bond measures in cities uh, and states around the country passed. And it was a uh, largely a result of, you know, what Bernie was talking about is tying whatever the revenue structure was to specific projects around transit. Uh, the, you know, the best example I think of there right now is Measure M in Los Angeles. They decided that to add a half cent sales tax, they're gonna spend $120 billion on transit over the next 40 years. And they had the specific projects fully mapped out. By California law, it needed a supermajority. They got, I believe, close to 70% of the vote because people saw those projects, saw the real impact, be it a bike lane, you know, a BRT station, a mass transit stop in their neighborhood and said, yes, that's worth an additional half cent sales tax because I'm seeing the value for not only transportation, but economic development and quality of life in my neighborhoods. Uh, and I think you know, we need to get in the Northeast around that and start saying, okay, you know, it's not about just the revenue stream, it's about what it goes to. And let's tie that together to specific projects and start talking about transit, you know, and other and resilience-related infrastructure. And are we willing to tax ourselves to do that? The other interesting example I was going to put out there was I think uh, much of what we now know as green infrastructure, so green roofs, rain gardens. A lot of that work was done early in Germany, and I believe the regulation there was you're only taxed, uh, you're taxed based on the amount of water that runs off your site. So if you're not doing green roofs and, and, and rain gardens, you get a higher tax. And so it incentivizes people to, to implement these things. I thought it was quite clever uh, in the way they did that. Um, at, the, at the risk of, I guess it's the risk of editorializing, um, uh, Brian pointed out that uh, in other places there are um, you know, votes, public votes about transportation matters. We actually, in the Boston area, do not have a mechanism to have a regional vote on transportation. There is legislation filed every year uh, to establish such districts. And if, if one were a concerned voter um, interested in this issue, it would conceivably something be something that that person could consider talking to their legislator about. OK. Uh, <laughs> level of the sea rising, other things are going to be changing too, like the temperature and the chemistry of the ocean, um, the ability of different species to thrive or even just to survive in our open spaces. We're not just superimposing today's environment into a wetter future, which is what a lot of the images that we see appear to be showing. You know, it's a huge uh, challenge uh, because uh, with increasing temperature, essentially what you're having are southern uh, tree species and plant species migrate further north uh, incrementally. And so a lot of what we're doing with our plant palettes is looking at those borderline plant communities, um, uh, putting in place plants um, uh, that could thrive in those future conditions and might just survive uh, for now. Um, 
there are there are opportunities actually within within a garden within a, a park to have pockets um, where you can actually design that environment um, that slightly changes uh, the climatic condition and, and almost creates uh, hot zones or cool zones within the park where you can already plant some of those species. So that's just one of those ways uh, that we're doing that. But you know, I mean, one of the hottest places in cities and, and, and where climate change comes down again to issues of equity is uh, in the inner city. Um, uh, in the inner city are typically barren trees. Uh, they get very, very hot. Um, and these are populations that don't always have access to air conditioning, can't move around uh, in the way that many of us can. And so, um, you know, we're talking about retrofitting buildings. I think it's also important to retrofit the basic urban fabric um, just simply to be able to cool the center of cities so that they become uh, more habitable. And, 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 and we certainly know a lot about this, but the, you know, it's the changes in the average the changes in the extreme, and then it's these swing seasons that we're having in Boston, which are crazy. And both our natural environment and our built environment is not meant to have 70 degree, 70 degree days in February, followed by a cold snap where it doesn't get above 30 for a week and a half. And you know that is, that is significant stressing on both our built and natural environment. The the other issue which is raised coastal, you know, because we showed a lot of coastal sectors, is we tend to focus in Boston on storm surge uh, and cataclysmic events. We've talked less about uh, tidal flood and tidal inundation. Uh, Union of Concerned Scientists for the last couple of years has been doing studies nationally uh, around the threat of tidal inundation. Uh, and right now we have, I think on the order of magnitude, 75 communities in the country that flood um, during their king tide each month. Um, most of them are in the Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, and it's 10 percent, they came up with an awesome metric. It was like 10 percent of the developed land mass is experiencing flooding at least once a month. Uh, during their high tide. And currently, our community is facing that today. If you extrapolate climate change to mid-century and end of century, that number you know, adds a factor of 10. We have 300 communities around uh, the country that are facing that. Eventually, Boston will face the twice a day high tide or the full moon high tide being fairly problematic. That is a different set of design solutions that are appropriate for that than preparing for you know, your warm 100 year storm. The combined factors that you, that you asked about, Stephanie, I think is also critical. We, um, and Eric developed this before I arrived, so I think zero credit, but an, an interesting tool called uh, WeatherShift, which allows you to combine uh, weather files around wind, because we know that wind patterns are changing, we're experiencing more intensity wind storms, uh, precip, and heat, to stress test building and infrastructure designs for future climate conditions. And you can choose your climate scenario, how optimistic or pessimistic you want to be, and stress test for 2070 or 2100 those conditions for specific designs and see, well, how does my building or asset I think we need to see more of that, both as standard practice in our profession and more of that required by government as sort of basic practice to get your permit to stress test for our future climate, not looking at code in our back line. Next record. Right, thank you. Um, my name is Kathy Rothenberg. I'm the Vice Chief Architect with DOJ API Director. Oh my goodness. Um, I have an observation that leads to a question. Um, the observation bond agencies, Moody's and Standard & Poor's, um, are placing stresses on cities in um, cities needing to have a resiliency plan in, in order to keep the bond rating and the bond agencies are looking at cities um, who may be deficient in this area as a way of adjusting or um, denigrating or downgrading their bonds. So that means that it will cost cities more money to borrow money be an incentive to um, strengthen their resiliency um, in order to keep a good bond rating and that efficiency. So to me, that's an interesting driver in the marketplace that leads, though, to wondering how, for designers like myself, all these good ideas that we put into the environment to respond in ways we think are beneficial to um, a resilient design, but what broader research on a big scale is happening today to identify metrics that will help cities define specifically on a big scale what needs to be done that can be measures 
um, for big projects and the small projects that you reference that help guide us specifically um, to meet metrics that will have an impact um, to, to him and to Tom. Yeah, so thanks very much for that question. We were um, actually the driver of that first Moody's working with Norfolk, Virginia. Um, so it's actually something I think we're really proud of because you know Norfolk is a um, very underinvested industrial city, uh, and their bond, their financing costs were um, actually increasing. Their bond rating was, uh, you know, on the precipice of going down, and having these conversations with Moody's about um, this very high. Their I think that their top ten uh, risk coastal city in the US um, and what actually would that mean so it was it was it came about as actually a discussion of is this possible to think of this um, both on the side of the city as an incentive and a driver for them to really think in a in a way that would target the financial industry and the rating industry and then on the other side I think a little bit what you were talking about was what does that mean for all of the work of all of the institutions that were was already going on and how do you aggregate that up into a citywide plan so a, a, an agency or an entity like Moody's can see that entire landscape. Um, and so a lot of the work that we did early on with Norfolk and thinking about that, we've reflected back into the rest of the world in the 100 cities that we're actually working with. So. Um, I'm glad you read an article on it. It, it clearly means that um, it's driving something and that that's a, um, that's a wonderful outcome. I think that there's only been two, maybe three U.S. cities that Moody's have reflected on this way, though. So we really need to increase some of that pressure. Um, on the ratings, um, there's a lot of them. And, um, you know, 100RC Rockefeller worked with Arab to develop the City Resilience Framework, which is being converted into uh, a pretty rigorous uh, metrics and analytic system. Um, and, but there's all sorts of them out there. The United Nations has uh, three or four separate kinds of indicators for sustain sustainability and risk, and now they're trying to aggregate. Um, the EU has something. There are so many of them that cities often feel overwhelmed and burdened by the number of different things that they have to respond to for different programs. So I'll give you an example. We use the City Resilience Framework that I'm talking about. Um, if you're a C40 city, which I think Boston also is a C40 city, you're reporting different sort of analysis back to get your grant from C40. Uh, and if you're part of the um, uh, some of the other mayor's networks like Bloomberg Networks or something else, you're reporting in on yet another system. So I think it's also incumbent on those of us who are working with cities trying to get them to do metrics to really understand the sort of driving forces that we can agree to um, and what, what cities actually need to sort of begin to calculate, um, not only so that we can use that for the city and not drive cities crazy, but then we have aggregate data that we can start using as a community to compare what actually is moving the margins, um, what's working. And until we actually have that, I'm really worried that um, Boston working with 100RC will have a really great analytical kind of framework that it's looking at, another city that's working with um, uh, another system is gonna look at something different and it'll all sort of not blend into data that we could use as a community to improve ourselves. So, so the um, City Resilience Framework uh, that you referenced, that's available to the public. Anybody can look at it. Uh, we have developed the metrics behind it. Uh, it's called the City Resilience Index. There are 156 qualitative and quantitative metrics. It's one of them out there. We um, love spending time with Rockefeller developing uh, the theory of the performance metrics. It's one system. I'd highlight, uh, you, you mentioned sort of Moody's and S&P, they're working on a group called the Task Force for Climate Risk Disclosure, uh, which is a Bloomberg funded um, and others initiative to try to normalize uh, from the investment side. What is the right, um, what, are, what are the right disclosure metrics around climate risk that is of interest to bondholders, that is of interest to insurance companies, that, that is of interest to finance? So I think that's a really important conversation that's happening now to try to normalize it. 
And the last thing that is, um, I found it very heartening now to see cities and companies beginning to align their metrics to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. New York City became the first city in the US to actually report out to the UN on progress against the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think we'll continue to see sort of it aligning its orientation, which holistically defines a target uh, that is you know, universally sort of consensus driven, uh, covers most if not all of the issues of focus we want to cover uh, in a fairly comprehensive way about what success looks like. Because I think you know, the underlying your question is it's hard to know if we're making progress, right? And what are the measures that show we're taking steps in the right direction, short of knowing that we have a carbon neutral society in 2050, right? And, and that's equitable and that's environmentally just and that, you know, but how do we know we're making progress on that path? And so I think that's a, that I found very hard. Great, thank you. Another question? Hi, um, I'm Doug Creed. I'm a professor at the University of Rhode Island. And uh, this discussion of the metrics kind of uh, allows for a good segue because I think it was Brian who said that this is less of a technical problem than a political and economic problem. And the, the 100RC, the index and so on, is kind of, in my view, almost like a political intervention more than it is a technical intervention. And so I'm wondering, how is 100RC useful as a learning platform for a city like Boston in terms of the, the, the political problems that it faces vis-a-vis -vis other cities? Because it does seem to me that it's a, it's a more important role. So for the answers of how if, if Boston is sort of reflecting upon itself and making those changes, um, to Brian, but what, what I'll say, in, what I'll say in general about it, it, it is yes, I concur. It is it is intended to be a political intervention, and it is tended, intended to be a political intervention that uh, engages with the community and forces um, public, private, uh, community groups, NGOs to come together with government. And our intention, very viscerally, is to try to hold that space. And whenever the city tries to get away from being a participant in that, um, our role has been to insist uh, that that sort of collective viewpoint actually comes together. So I think what, what our, um, one of the things that I think that we've, we've done, um, good, bad, or ugly, is force those conversations to happen, uh, even when the politicians want to run away. And um, they want to run away a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just said that the CRF and the CRI allowed folks to have a measure of their relative stance across particular issues to begin that conversation. So it allowed a much more in-depth conversation, not only at the mayoral level, but within City Hall, because resilience is an embedded issue in almost every city function, to say, well, how are we doing across these different spectrums? And what does success look like? So what are other cities doing that actually, you know, look a little bit better and they have similar demographics and, you know, how have they gotten there? And what has been their political process? Because the reality is the mayor very rarely wants to be absolutely first on anything, right? They'd like to be recognized as first if it's successful, but they don't actually want to be first on anything to try something that's new and different. You want to be second in improving on what somebody else did. And I think that's part of what, you know, 100RC and, and the CRF and this conversation allows for is some certainty that, yeah, I'll take the banner from, you know, Boston will take the banner from New York and take it that next step further with the lessons learned on what not to do and what to do. And it's through that networking and that measurement of sort of progress that then allows you to do that. I think we've got time for one more question. Wow. Um, hi, I'm Kathleen Fitzgerald. I'm from the Cambridge Environmental Literacy Project. I'm coming here as a mom, as you can see, um, literally from the dinner table. My question goes to the issue of people and resiliency and the issue of nature equity as we become increasingly urbanized, um, growing further and further away from nature. So I guess my question is, I love looking at all the possibilities of what the waterfront will look like, but what's embedded in the neighborhoods, things like potential microforests. We spoke a little bit about pocket parks and the things that could be there. What can we do with schools, with libraries, to engage people now, because it has to happen now, in these kinds of conversations? Because we're the ones who are reading the articles and looking for them. But there are people who aren't because they aren't necessarily the people who grew up with nature with thinking about this sort of thing because the issues they're dealing with are very different. So, I hope, does that make sense? I hope. Sure. 
Um, I think I think there's an opportunity, um, sort of using using this these different planning processes as an entryway into a conversation. So, um, and there's opportunities to bring the conversation to a very direct level. So, Boston Public Schools, lots of different kinds of challenges. One of them, uh, I'm not going to quote the statistic because I'm not going to exactly get it right, but. Uh, Students, teachers, you know, administrators are having to drink bottled water because there's just, you know, not quality, uh, you know, water fountains and, and, and drinkable water in schools. And when you think about, um, you know, as the summer, he, you know, heat sort of extends longer, right? Early days, even this year, this school year, right? A, a number of uh, communities across the state were, kind of, you know, kind of heat days instead of, of snow days. and so. I think when you can bring the conversation to a very practical level, you can um, uh, you can engage people, you know, in in surprising and interesting ways. And so, you know, what are the opportunities, um, you know, as the city is doing sort of a you know a broad reup of the climate plan um, to have different kinds of pieces of our social infrastructure sort of take responsibility for doing aspects of this. And it's complicated because you know schools and other Community um, stakeholders are being. We're all asked to, you know, to be doing so much, and so what are the opportunities to kind of integrate it into conversations that are, you know, already happening? Spaces where people are already gathering um, and make it practical and useful. I think this is where <clears throat> landscape is really powerful. Um, it can do a lot of things from an environmental standpoint and and, and help us defend. Uh, climate change, um, but it's also important in that it's just simply beautiful and connects people to nature. Um, we're working with an African-American artist, uh, Damon Davis, in St. Louis, and we've been working in some pretty tough neighborhoods in St. Louis that are have a lot of vacancy or barren, a lot of unemployment, and he said, you know, day to day these kids see blight over and over and over again. I just want to plant trees. I want to give them nature. I just want to bring moments of joy into their everyday lives, and that's incredibly powerful. Uh, let's try one more quick question, I hope, and we'll try to get you a quick answer. Okay, we'll see if it's quick. So, um, I'm coming from a background in ecology uh, and biology and moving into a public <laughs> health space, and part of the reason that I made that shift is because I think that public health, what you were saying, earlier motivates people to make change more than just an environmental argument and maybe and I'm hearing that is on the same thing and maybe on the design side. So where are the gaps in public health knowledge? Like what is it that you need? What would be powerful in making the right arguments to the right people to see change happen? Interesting. What do you what do you need to know? What is what would you have an aspiring public health uh, inquiry, what, 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 what does somebody look for? I think there's a lot of work actually going, going on this. There's some social scientists that are working on this at NYU, um, some work going on at the um, University of Chicago that's really well known about um, risk factors in, in communities when there was a disaster. Um, there's a lot post-Katrina on all these public health uh, sides. Where I think the failure might be is how do we make a more intentional connection with those things and, you know, frankly, use them as marketing tools and devices to trigger people's minds. Um, you know, one of the, one, for, for example, one of the biggest risk factors for cancer and death in Mexico is uh, through lung cancer. Um, attributed um, by and large to uh, uh, unclean buildings, unclean exhaust transportation. So we were thinking with Mexico City, like how do you, how do you actually connect the dot between, you know, what's going on in that sector, those people's lack of control, and their public health issue? Like, how do you make something of that spectrum? Um, I'm not sure exactly what the answer is, but I think the knowledge exists in those. Tools. We just don't know how to translate it into action just yet. 
Yeah, I was also going to say, I think part of it is how the conversation tends to be focused as well. So I think when there is uh, a crisis, a disaster, there's a lot of focus on the response, which makes a lot of sense, but we also have to pay a lot of attention to the recovery. And so we've learned a lot about what not to do from Katrina and the damage, the lifelong damage, unfortunately, that that, that, that causes. I think public health is also a space that needs more resources to be at the table in these conversations. Um, and there are, you're right, there are a lot of really good ideas, really interesting ways that people are thinking about um, the recovery process from a public health lens. I think part of the struggle too with the resiliency conversation is sort of the balance between is our work about addressing the symptoms and, or you know, are we also then trying to sort of get at some of the root causes and I think um, oftentimes our sort of plans and conversations are a bit all over the place. So, you know, I think a lot of us tonight are, um, you know, are, are really echoing the need to sort of use this as an opportunity to look at the root causes that, um, that lead to poor public health outcomes and how can we shift those. But, you know, I don't know necessarily how widespread that agreement is uh, across the country, sort of across the field. I'll give you two very quick tangible examples, if, if I could prioritize two of you. Uh, one on the climate uh, mitigation side of things. Oftentimes addressing other air pollutants, also we you know, is addressing the fossil fuel industry and reducing emissions. There was a phenomenal uh, pilot study done in Louisville over the last couple of years using big data um, and micro location with inhalers. And folks signed on to have their inhaler tracked to say, where was I exactly when an asthmatic episode happened and was there an environmental trick? And being able to then identify, okay, is this intersection or is this, you know, uh, is this plant, is this an exhaust pipe, uh, is this layover yard, you know, in terms of rail layover yards, and be able to then address that and create the scientific link between causal and environmental health uh, issues and timing and when it happens and the emissions at the time. So I think we're at the beginning of being able to do that, and that's a phenomenal area for public health research. On the resilience side, you know, both Katrina and now Florence. A lot of the attention is on the physical disaster at the moment and the recovery efforts, a lot less attention on the long-term health impacts of those disasters. And in Katrina, you had massive benzene spills when oil tanks in San Bernard's Parish were pulled off, as you probably covered. They got a lot less coverage than the physical disasters, and, and you know, rightfully so, of homes and you know, immediate disasters, but the health impacts over the long term are no less challenging. And you had communities that had to, you know, were ripped apart by benzene pollution. Um, not by the hurricane, but by poor operating practices of well refiners. Florence, I don't know if folks have seen the New York Times article on you know the pig farms, right? And on the waste. You have a hazardous waste crisis that is spreading across thousands of acres in North Carolina, which will have long-term implications on both animal health and human health. Are, are we getting teed up to actually track that so that we then have the evidence to require updating regulations that in North Carolina have been updated since the 1960s on protecting manure lagoons? And, and having that public health argument, I think, is the most compelling argument to force change in terms of resilience practices. So I think that's three dissertation topics right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we're approaching the end of our period. Uh, I would like to put uh, the members of our panelists on the spot for a sort of lightning round in you know, 10 or 20 words or less. Um, you know, the folks here who were kind enough to come out tonight, is there a, you know, in the context of green space and climate resilience, is there one thing that you, or a thing that you would ask them to do to be helpful to um, these efforts going forward? Chris? Yeah, I think um, uh, there's a lot of great planning work that's been done. I think now's the time to do some real demonstration projects to put something in the ground in a public environment so that people can uh, touch and feel and smell what, what it is that we're talking about. It's one thing to make drawings. It's another thing to actually get people to interact in those environments. Hello. Um, I agree, and I think in addition to acting, we need to make sure that the demonstration exemplars that we hope to create are highly educated and openly uh, researched, openly visited, openly toured, so that we can create a flywheel for uh, worldwide success, because we will not be resilient uh, one and only, we will be resilient only all of us together. Um, I'll add on that, I'll partner back to Chris's intro, which is you know, we, we don't have any time to simply be planning anymore. 
We need to start taking action. Uh, and even in a state, you know, as blue as Massachusetts and as progressive as Massachusetts, uh, we need more action. And so understanding where your local rep and where your local state senator sits uh, on critical issues, so taking action, doing the self-taxing that we talked about, you know, taking the, you know, the policy positions that will allow us to actually make the investments that have in the future, uh, we are still relatively very politically inactive in Massachusetts when it comes to holding our politicians accountable for what we know is coming down the pipeline. Working with um, Ms. Fitzgerald, um, you came up to the podium and had the courage to say, I'm a mother, I'm concerned about my community, um, I want to do this, um, and how do we support you? And so, if you'd like to stay after this and have a what we can do to support you, I'd be happy to. That's what we need to be doing. A lot of pressure being <laughs> um, Participate in our democracy. This is these conversations about our democracy. Um, and meet your neighbors and figure out how we are going to take care of each other as we move forward. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I